Just days after the province declared a state of emergency for this COVID-19 crisis, Michael Sabia argued in the pages of the Globe and Mail that now is the time for governments to take bold action to reshape the economy. He is the director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the U of T and chair of Canada's Infrastructure Bank. Six months into this unprecedented situation, are governments getting it right? Let's ask Michael Sabia, who joins us now from Montreal, Quebec. It's good to see you. It's good to meet you, actually. I don't think we've ever met before. Um, we're not exactly meeting and shaking hands or bumping elbows, but this is the next best thing in a pandemic. I want to um, hearken to that expression that the former Chicago mayor, Rahm Emanuel, uh, used, which you mentioned in your Globe and Mail piece, that, you know, you never want to let a serious crisis go to waste. Six months later, um, how are governments in this country doing at making that wish come true? Well, look, I think um, I think if you look back for a moment, um, I think you have to say that um, governments in Canada have generally performed, uh, you know, pretty well. And when I say that, I mean, let's take this in two dimensions. There are the health issues, the protecting Canadians issues, uh, where, you know, if you compare our situation uh, to the real crisis in the United States, um, or uh, the situation in a number of European countries, I think you have to say that governments have done a pretty good job. Federal and provincial governments have done a pretty good job about that. And then it, if you look at the more economic dimension of this, and here I mean the relief measures that governments have taken to mitigate the impact of what was, uh, you know, an economic, uh, shutting down an economy is, a, is an economic, um, is a large-scale economic crisis, and there I think I'm probably understating. And there, the speed with which they moved, um, you know, all of that I think has been good. Now, and 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 because of that, I think we have seen some improvement in the economy uh, over the last few months, etc. As things have opened up. Now, the issue is looking forward. And here I think, uh, you know, and I'm stealing a phrase here from the chairman of the Federal Reserve a few weeks ago when he said, it gets tougher from here. And I think that's right. It gets tougher from here because economies have opened in that spring that we got from opening up the economies, that's kind of behind us. We are facing some uncertainties around the virus itself. Um, and very importantly, very importantly, I think we're facing this issue about confidence, business confidence, consumer confidence, the willingness of consumers to spend, of businesses to invest, because that spending and that investment, I mean, that's the fuel that makes our economic engine go. Um, and right now, for I think quite understandable reasons, consumers are on the sidelines and businesses are largely on the sidelines. So the test, I think the test for governments uh, that is now pretty much upon us, is taking actions, developing plans to address that issue of confidence. And how do you do that? I think you do that through plans that drive growth, that create growth. Canada needs growth. Our growth potential is not what it should be. Uh, we're near the bottom of the G7. Uh, we're pretty low in the G20. We need to create growth because growth creates confidence. Confidence creates spending and investment. That makes the economic engine go. And second, finally, you know, growth also helps us uh, manage some of the debt that we've accumulated because if we can get our economy growing uh, at a reasonable rate, then that debt is going to become a, a smaller and smaller percentage of our total GDP. Well, a bunch of things to follow up on there. So let me let me start with debt and deficits, which you left off at. Um, you know, uh, I guess one of the things that's been astonishing through the course of this pandemic has been the real change in attitude that so many people have had toward deficits, which in the past so many people saw as evil. And now we've got a deficit approaching $400 billion dollars and you haven't got too many people out there saying that they're too concerned about this. Uh, the new finance minister, Christian Freeland, uh, recently tried to reassure the business community that prudent fiscal management is still something she cares about, knowing that the deficit is where it is. How would you interpret her statement on that? Well, I think it's a recognition that um, 
you know, Canada, we are not a reserve currency. People don't need to own Canadian debt. Um, and therefore, addressing and ensuring market confidence is something that's important here uh, to ensure that there are markets for Canadian debt, that Canadian Canada continues to be an attractive place for, for foreign investment. Uh, so I, I give her credit for the comment and I think the commitment that it reflects, that the recognition that it reflects, that that issue is important. Now, that being said, uh, to come back to where your question started, I think a lot of things have changed. Um, and I think a lot of things have been changing for a while. It's not just all COVID related. Um, so, you know, is this an urgent pressing issue? Um, honestly, I think it is not. Um, now, that being said, I think I come back to my first comment about maintaining market confidence. Obviously, that's critically important. Um, so I'm not diminishing the importance of that. But I am saying that if you look at Canada's deficit or debt position, because I think the debt position is more important, and you compare us to either the G20 or to the 40 largest industrialized uh, countries in the world, our debt to GDP is actually relatively good, um, relatively smaller. Not small, but smaller. And as a very great investor, Mohamed El Arian, you know, once said, in a neighborhood where everybody has relatively dirty shirts, well, you're okay as long as your shirt is relatively cleaner <laughs> because everything's relative. And you can't just buy German Bunds all day. You have to buy other kinds of, of, of debt. So on a relative basis, you know, I think Canada's position uh, is manageable. And then my final comment would be, I think if you look ahead, you know, what does that reflect? I think it reflects the market's judgment around inflation because that has changed fundamentally. And it's changed fundamentally uh, because of, you know, there's very little pressure on wages. Now that may be a bad thing from an equity point of view. So I'm not suggesting I think that's a good thing, but from an inflation point of view, it does keep inflation down. That's, that's one thing. Second, Global growth rates are relatively modest, so there's not much pressure there. Third, um, we live in, a, in an economy where value is created through intangibles, through knowledge, and that's less, each unit of growth, if you will, is less capital intensive than it was. We, we live in a world where there's basically a savings glut in the world, and those deficits help soak those things up. So that's all to say, that the outlook for inflation, and central bankers across the world have been saying this, is for very, very modest inflation going forward. So when I look at the whole thing, I say, well, you know, if I had a choice between dealing with the deficit of, of weak infrastructure or the deficit of a digital divide or the deficit of, of significant social inequality, those are all deficits that matter. And I think addressing those right now is at least as important uh, is managing our fiscal situation, which I think, as I said, on a relative basis, is manageable. All right, let me pick up on the growth angle that you touched on in your first answer. You're now chairing the Infrastructure Bank, and I wonder if you could just tell us what role you see it playing in encouraging that growth that you think is so necessary for the future of the country. Um, well, look, I think in lots of ways. Um, you know, just a word on on the bank, um, you know, what is it? Because I think a lot of people don't really know what an infrastructure bank is and, and you know, understandably so. Uh, you know, traditionally governments fund infrastructure by writing a check, by providing a grant. They pay 100% of it and of course, in that kind of context, they don't get their money back. The bank is different. Uh, what we do is we provide uh, low cost financing so that we try to push projects through a viability threshold so that we actually get those projects done. And second, we always do it with an eye to bringing in private capital. And there are enormous sources of private capital in the world looking to invest in steady assets like infrastructure. So every dollar of money coming from the bank is matched by $1 or perhaps $2 coming from others, which increases the magnitude, the size of everything that we can, we can do. And then third, we always want to get our money back. 
so that we keep investing, we get a flywheel of investment underway. Now, so I think it's an efficient way to get infrastructure built and building infrastructure right now is extremely important. It's extremely important because as we just discussed, you know, governments do have to manage um, their overall fiscal situations, number one, and we're, I think, a more efficient way of doing it from a financial point of view. It's super important from a jobs and productivity point of view. Infrastructure is one of the best ways of improving uh, national productivity. And what's growth? Growth is just increase in the labor force and productivity. So it's super important uh, there. And finally, it's an opportunity uh, to help us shape the future of our economy. If you like, infrastructure is a bit like a, I don't know, it's like a skeleton. Um, and if you can modernize that or adapt that, then you can shape the future of our economy and you can shape the future growth potential of our economy. So, you know, those are some of the things that we're trying to accomplish at the bank. And we're going to do that through, you know, investing in the expansion of broadband so that people are connected to broadband. The, the, the COVID crisis has certainly taught us that that's not a luxury. We're going to do it uh, with a focus on climate change and, and um, building retrofits and, and, and cleaner commutes uh, through renewables. Um, we're going to do it through things like um, expanding irrigation uh, in Canadian agriculture, large scale irrigation, because that makes that more productive, helps our exports, helps secure the future of Canadian agriculture. There's a whole range of things we can do that both create jobs now, which we need, but at the same time, have a constructive long term impact on the growth potential of the Canadian economy. One of the reasons we've been anxious to have you on this program is not just to talk about what we've just talked about, but to also get you to take that hat off and put your monk school hat on because post-secondary is going through cataclysmic change right now. And, you know, you're the director of the monk school, which is a beautiful bricks and mortar institution in downtown Toronto. The building looks gorgeous. The stuff that happens inside that building is important to the future of the country. But I wonder how much this pandemic has changed our view about how much bricks and mortar educating we need going forward and how much of this is actually going to move online forever. Do you have thoughts on that? Um, well, look, I'm, uh, I'm new at the higher education business, so I'll be cautious in my response. Um, look, I think online education, and we spent a lot of time uh, at the school over the last number of months on this issue, um, preparing in the best possible way and trying to be creative about, um, about how we do it, about producing content in the same way that you and your profession produce content for, for, for television. And I think through that process, you know, we've, we've discovered lots of things. We've discovered the potential of creating global classrooms. I mean, we're a school of global affairs and public policy. So having access to people around the world being part of a global conversation that uh, online uh, techniques allow us to do. Those are positives. Um, and, and the ability it gives us to reach out, those are all positives. Now, that being said, and you know, I think generally, we need to be very careful. Yes, we're in the middle of an extraordinary event. And it understandably attracts a very large percentage of our attention. We're all very much focused on this. But I think we need to be cautious in assuming that what is happening today because of the measures that are needed to manage the pandemic are necessarily fixtures for the future. I'm skeptical about that. Will it change the fundamental how we do things? I'm, again, I'm skeptical. I doubt that. So online learning, online outreach, global classrooms, will they have a role to play going forward? Yes, they will. But are they going to replace the richness of students being together in a classroom with a professor, exchanging views, debating ideas, developing creative solutions to 
some of the world's greatest problem? I hope not. I don't not. think so. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. In the same way that, you know, there are people today who say, oh, God, downtown, that no one will go downtown anymore. There won't be meetings and office buildings anymore. I don't agree with that. We'll get back. We'll recover from this. We'll recover the rhythm of life that we all grew up with. Will some things change? Yes, some things will change. But being with people, exchanging with people, that's part of who we are. And I think that's, I think that's gonna happen, whether it's in a law firm, an investment business like the one I used to be in, or in a school like the Monk School at U of T. Well, let me do a quick follow-up on this, because I think at the University of Toronto, fully a quarter of the students last year were foreign students meaning they came from other places in the world and they paid inflated tuitions, which allows, of course, domestic students to keep our uh, tuition costs much lower. And 60% of those foreign students came from China. And we're not getting along with China all that well these days. So I wonder how concerned you are about a scenario where China just decides, you know what, we're not sending any more students to Toronto. And what does that do to the bottom line of the U of T and the Monk School? I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I think the... The Chinese authorities are far too smart for that. Uh, I think they're they're rightly focused on the future of their country and how they can enhance that future to the maximum possible degree. One of the ways of doing that is uh, having talented Chinese students attend uh, great universities, be it at the University of Toronto, be it uh, Oxford or Cambridge, be it Harvard or Stanford or Chicago. Um, and I think the, the Chinese are very good at understanding what works for them. And I think they're gonna continue to, to want to do that because it is in their interests. And, I, and it is in our interest that that happens. Uh, so in my opinion, this is something that works both for the Chinese and for, in this case, the University of Toronto or Canada. Um, why do I say that? I say that because China, it will be the world's largest economy. And as Canadians, we are going to have to work with that reality because it's an undeniable reality. And we are going to have to find ways of working with the Chinese, of exchanging with them. Yes, there are going to be some things that we disagree about. Human rights issues are obvious. The situation in the immediate term of the two Michaels is obviously a major, major issue. But beyond that, down the road, China will be one of, it will, its rivalry with the United States is going to restructure how the global order works. And as Canadians, we need to be part of that. We need to be linked in. Um, with China. We need to be able to exchange with them. Students coming here, that's part of it. But I think we also need to think more broadly about the technology issues, about the climate issues, etc. because China's not going away. And as Canadians, we're going to need to find ways of working constructively with the Chinese and them with us. Hmm. Michael Sabre, we're down to our last few minutes here. And um, I don't know you at all, and I'm going to go out on a limb here and do something uh, a little cheeky, um, and that is that I'm going to ask you about something that I suspect you haven't been asked about in an interview in a very, very long time, and that is, you know, one of the most impressive, forceful, feminist conservatives I ever met, and we're going back 40 years now, was a woman named Laura Sabia, who was your mother, who was really a force of nature. And I know there are, there's a whole generation of younger people in this country who don't know who she is, but I've got her son sitting here on TVO tonight, and I want you to talk about your mom and what she was, first of all, what she was like as a mother, and to, and to watch your mother be one of the very early feminists in this country do her thing. Um, well, one, it's very kind of you to, to remember her. So, uh, so thank you for that, because I, as you can imagine, very much, uh, very much remember her. Answer to your first question, she was, um, she was, she was great. Um, I mean, she was really great. Um, 
So in terms of what kind of a mother was she? I mean, she was terrific um, and lots of fun. Um, you know, more broadly, in terms of sort of the impact that she had um, on me, uh, I mean, I like to think that she had an impact in advancing rightly the cause of, of women. Because when you think back into those days, my goodness, women were in a different situation than they are, are today. So if she contributed in some small way to improving that, that was great. But in terms of me, you know, my mother, um, one of the things that motivated my mother was that she just refused to accept being the object of discrimination. And she experienced that, I think, in two ways, both being uh, of Italian descent, uh, which in those days uh, still brought with it uh, discrimination, and second, being a woman, where clearly in those days women were, were discriminated against. And she fought that really all her life. Um, and it's, as many other people do, um, coming from similar backgrounds or different backgrounds, it's not, you know, she wasn't unique, and I'm certainly not. Um, and that, you know, the impact that that had on me, watching her do that, and as I got older, becoming more conscious of that, I think what, and this was a great gift she gave me. Um, I mean, that sort of fight, that resolution on her part, um, that got passed down to me in a kind of, I don't know, a, for, a kind of being determined. Um, you know, never really being satisfied that you've done the job well enough. Um, you know, always a kind of sense of you need to do better. Um, you need to contribute more. Uh, you need to find a way to make the job better uh, than, than, than it is. That determination has been a, a huge gift to me. And, um, and again, I don't say that because I think I'm, I'm special or unique. I think that's true for a lot of people who come from either immigrant backgrounds or from uh, people who are wrongly discriminated against. Um, but that had a had a very, very important impact on me. Well, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit in as much as your mom was special and was unique, and I'm really glad that I got a chance to meet her and interview her back in the day, and her son tonight on TVO. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure. That's Michael Sabia. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.